Yeah, I can see that. So uh, while we're waiting, I, you know, you put me on after probably one of the, better, uh, the best speeches so far and after a funky guy with a guitar, so you must really hate me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, Nick Webb. I'm a, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at uh, Union College. Um, my co-presenter, Professor Jen Goodall from U Albany, uh, can't be here today. She's at another conference in Portland, which seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, there have been many other people who have helped uh, with this work. Notably on the slide, I want to uh, tell you about Katie DeCora, who's a graduate student from U Albany. And uh, for the evaluation stuff that I'm going to very briefly introduce, there's uh, Eugene Judson uh, from uh, uh, Plymouth Research. Uh, so what am I here to tell you about today? Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the Social Robotics Workshop. Um, the goal uh, for me, uh, for us, is to interest uh, people in computer science. And it may come as a bit of a surprise to you that there are some uh, uh, problems with that goal. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, even though you're a room of extremely educated people, you may not know actually what computer science is. Um, this is a problem that we have. It is a genuine problem. People don't know what computer science is. Uh, the second problem is, and again, I'm sure this will come as a surprise to many of you, computer science can be a little bit dry. Uh, that is, it's not as entertaining as possibly we could make it. Uh, and the third problem, a very real problem, is that computer science doesn't attract as many girls, women and girls, as we should. And uh, those are three problems, and we wanted to set out to address those uh, somehow. And the solution that we came up with is something called social robotics. Uh, so what is computer science? Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity, as I have a captive audience, to actually explain what it is. Uh, to do that in one slide is, is quite difficult, but I will try. Uh, it is more than computer programming. So when we talk about computer science, a lot of people imagine that we are just computer programmers, that we sit in a room, and, you know, a darkened room usually, and we write uh, computer programs. And yes, of course, we do do that. Um, but really what we're interested in is behaviors. We're interested in ways of thinking about solving problems. Uh, we want to create behaviors that we want machines, computers, robots, whatever they are, to do. Uh, we have to sit there and think about what those behaviors are. We have to think, as we say, algorithmically. Uh, and this is a problem that is um, way beyond what, what you see in computer science. Thinking algorithmically is just a generally good thing to be doing. Uh, and then you have to write down that algorithm in a way that a machine understands it, you hope. Uh, and then you actually have to test it. So there's an all, all sorts of skills in that process which we think are, are very useful, whether you're going to be a computer scientist or not. Uh, why does it matter? We think that kids need computer science for lots of reasons. There are lots of things that you can do with the skills you acquire when you are studying to be a computer scientist, or just taking computer science courses. Uh, there's math skills and design. Hopefully, that's obvious. You can actually see math in action, for example. Uh, there's problem solving. That always seems to be a pretty good skill for people to have, I would have thought. Uh, there's logical reasoning, right? And there's critical thinking. These are all skills that we attempt to develop in a, in a computer science type classroom. And of course, there's economic opportunities, which particularly in today's economy means jobs. And let's be quite clear about this. I'm not trying to convert everybody to be a computer scientist. That would be ridiculous. Uh, what I am trying to say is that no matter what career your uh, kids today go and do, they will be interacting with computers in some way or another. Your toaster has a computer in it. Right? So uh, having a little bit of knowledge about computers, how they work, why they do what they do, why they're good at what they're good at, and more importantly, why they're bad at what they're bad at, is a really good set of information to have, no matter what it is you're going to be. Uh, why do computer scientists uh, want to recruit more people? Why do we need more kids? Well, again, hopefully this is obvious. Uh, we're in the business of innovation, of creating tomorrow's technology, and we need more people to help us do that. Uh, we need people with creativity to bring new solutions. And we really need the diversity of thought and ideas. Uh, there's lots of um, ways of illustrating this. Uh, Bill Gates had a great quote when he was in uh, Saudi Arabia. He was presenting to a room that was predominantly men and women. They were divided by a, a barrier so they couldn't see each other. And he was asked uh, what were the likelihoods of uh, Saudi Arabia being one of the top 10 countries uh, in terms of information technology. And his answer was that until Saudi Arabia engaged 100% of their workforce, the chances of actually making that advancement were, were very slim. We're obviously not in that situation, but we are in a situation where uh, we could be doing more to recruit uh, women and uh, minorities into uh, computer science. OK, so now I've told you a little bit about computer science, what's social robotics. Well, hopefully I don't have to explain to you what robotics is. Uh, you all know or have an idea of what robotics is, usually from uh, film or TV. Uh, social robotics has got a lot easier to explain since the uh, movie Wall-E. If anybody saw Wall-E, you already know what a social robot is. Wall-E is a very social robot. Um, but just to give you a sort of formal definition, uh, social robots will interact with us in our world. That is, uh, we will be working with them. They will be operating alongside us. In order to do that, uh, they need to cooperate. 
communicate and collaborate with us as humans. Uh, they need to, in that case, understand a little bit about us. What is it that we are trying to do? What is it that we are thinking and feeling? Uh, and uh, what do robots need to be able to achieve this? Now, there's a lot of really interesting research in there that we're doing in our labs, but that's not really what I'm talking to you about today. Let me just give you a quick example of what a social robot could be. Hopefully, uh, uh, some of you uh, recognize this as a Roomba. Do people recognize a Roomba? Yep. Anybody have one? Awesome. Is it social? Uh, it, doesn't talk back. it doesn't talk back, but it could. Uh, this is a Roomba. Uh, imagine that it is in your kitchen, and it is uh, uh, vacuuming in your kitchen around your extremely uh, large garbage bin. And uh, it bangs into your garbage bin. Well, that's perfectly fine. That should be OK. Uh, but if it happens to be vacuuming around you in the kitchen, and it bangs into you, uh, and it hurts, uh, then really, uh, it should apologize. Right? <laughs> this is a very simple social behavior, but it would change things quite significantly. Um, or another example, of these things you can generally program to come on at a particular time of day. So let's say you program it to come on at 1 o'clock because you're never at home at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. However, one day you happen to be working from home and you're on the telephone, you're sealing some sort of a deal, you know, the, offer, uh, uh, the offer seems really good, but of course it's 1 o'clock, so the Roomba switches on, as it would, and starts vacuuming. They're fairly noisy, so you'd, you'd notice it. Uh, and of course you interrupt your conversation and say, oh, hang on a second, hang on, Roomba, not now. And what you would want, of course, is for the Roomba to stop immediately and then reschedule itself, right? Um, these are two very simple behaviors that if we gave them to these uh, consumer appliances now would actually improve uh, our lives with these machines. Now, this is actually the reality. Uh, this is a, a, an example of a social robot from uh, CMU. It's actually very, uh, it's quite capable. What it does is it wanders down corridors and it's aware of uh, people coming the other way and it will move out of the way as you walk down the corridor. The problem is, is it doesn't look very social. In fact, it looks more like the garbage can from my earlier slide. And what, what happened when they released it in the corridors of CMU was that people flattened themselves against the wall to get the heck out of the way, <laughs> which is perfectly reasonable behavior. Okay? Again, uh, there's lots of things here that are challenges for our lab that uh, we have to look at, but that's not really what I'm talking about. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is why this is interesting educationally speaking. Right? What makes this an interesting educational opportunity? And the reason is it's convergence of many potential areas. It's not just a computer science and an engineering problem, although believe me, there's plenty of those. Um, it's also a design problem. So the earlier slide hopefully demonstrates that we need to design better looking robots. Um, we need to engage with people from communication, from uh, psychology, from philosophy. There are the, all kinds of ethical issues about the way that these robots are gonna be working alongside us. They are a great platform for engaging all kinds of different people from different areas in a conversation about a technology which will be with us relatively shortly. Um, you can also see the outcomes. You can start to talk about things and see what impact it's gonna have on people's daily lives. You can envisage the future and you can make it real. You can make it alive and that hopefully addresses the dry aspect of computer science. I always like to have a so what slide, so here's my so what slide. Uh, the so what slide says, uh, yeah, what does this have to do with anything in particular? Well, uh, I was a, a, a PI of, a, of this social robotics of the uh, Capital Region Consortium that, that was funded by the National Science Foundation, and I was giving a presentation with Professor Goodall uh, at, uh, for Girls Inc. Uh, in the area, and we were just sort of telling them about social robotics. We weren't really actually getting them to do very much. Um, but what surprised us was that the questions that they asked us were fantastic. These were uh, uh, girls ranging from grade 3 to grade 12. And the uh, questions they asked us, the engagement they had was phenomenal. And we really saw this as a potential opportunity. We saw that social robotics was something that perhaps we could use. So this is the question. Can we use the concept of social robotics to in introduce students and interest students, middle and high school students, in computer science? And in particular, can we interest girls? So we wanted to design a robot, uh, a robot workshop, I should say. Uh, we got some funding from the National Center of Women in Information Technology to design a workshop where we would have students go through the process of designing a social robot. Now, obviously, they're not going to be building one from scratch. That would take far too long. Um, but we wanted them to think about a social robot application. Um, they, uh, the girls that we originally uh, worked with had great ideas. They wanted robots to uh, get uh, ice cream from the freezer. That was a very popular one. Um, who wouldn't want that? Uh, but things like uh, robots that would help around the home or would care for animals or that kind of thing, using very simple behaviors, using abstractions of behaviors. We used that money from the National Center of Women in Information Technology, NCWIT, their seed fund money, to buy some LEGO NXT robots. We bought 10 robot kits and 10 laptops. Those laptops are running this NXTG graphical programming interface. So there is programming involved, but it's kind of drag and drop. It's very, very easy to get involved with. 
So we have 10 laptops and 10 robot kits. We can support classrooms of up to 30 middle or high school students at any one time. Um, the workshop structure that we put together, we have them do uh, all kinds of different exercises. Uh, group exercises where they talk about the kind of robots that they've seen on film and TV or in uh, books. Uh, we have them do a role play exercise where one of the workshop leaders plays the role of a, ro of a robot and have the students try to uh, get us to complete a task just by talking to us. And what's fascinating about that is they give us an instruction and they don't fully think it through and so we end up attempting to walk through walls and that kind of thing. Um, and then we actually get them into doing some programming. Only we don't really necessarily tell them they're programming. We tell them that they're trying to solve a series of problems related to being a social work, uh, robot. Can they get around? Uh, can they move? Can they not run into objects? If they do run into objects, can they apologize? Um, these are all things that you can get the simple Lego NXT robot to do. And at the end of it, they have created a social robot. Um, what's interesting about this, uh, well, there's a lot of things. We've performed the workshop about 25 times, over 25 times now in, a, in about a, a year and a half to two years. We've engaged over 350 students from uh, middle and high schools around the region. We've targeted groups such as uh, uh, STEP that occur on a lot of the university sites here, uh, the Girl Scout, Games in Education, uh, Green Light for Girls, um, as well as individual school programs. We have publications at SIGSI, which is the uh, Special Information Group on Computer Science Education. And uh, what we've done is collected evaluation information. What that means is we survey all of the participants of the workshop, both before the workshop and after. And we sort of compare what's happened during the workshop. Here's a quick breakdown of, of uh, uh, oh, I've lost some things have disappeared. I, I will do this magically. Uh, the left one uh, shows you quite clearly. I, 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 uh, the left one shows you quite clearly the age ranges that we've, uh, that we've uh, uh, hit. <laughs> Uh, and, and you are right to be amazed. Uh, it starts at grade three at the left-hand side and goes up to grade 11 on the right-hand side. The two biggest peaks there correspond to grade five and to grade 10. Um, so those are the age ranges that we're hitting in our workshop. And the equally well-marked graph on the other side uh, shows the distribution between uh, female students and male students. We don't exclude male students. Um, in fact, we, we will take anybody. Um, but we definitely try and target uh, uh, females more, and we've, done, uh, we've uh, managed to present the workshop to twice as many girls as boys as it stands. Um, so what does our evaluation say? I want to make it very clear that this is indicative at this stage. Uh, this, is, this is relatively early stuff, so uh, let's not get carried away. However, it seems that our workshop has a distinct positive influence on girls. Uh, we did, by which I, we, I mean Eugene Judson from Plymouth Research, took a, an early sampling of our results from March of this year, uh, constituting 59 students, 26 boys, 33 girls, and looked at three particular questions. One is, what was their knowledge of computing prior and after our exposure to the workshop? Second, what was the likelihood to pursue a career in technology or science? And third, what was their interest in robots? Now, it should be, I guess, no surprise, even though it's extremely disappointing, that prior to the workshop, girls and boys have very significant different scores across all age ranges for these three questions. Um, girls are significantly lower in those three areas prior to doing our workshop, which is kind of sad in a way that we've gotten to a point where boys are perceived somehow naturally to have more of an interest in these topics. But what's really interesting is what happens afterwards when we've had exposure to our workshop. Uh, the data indicates that after the workshop, there's no significant difference between the two groups, boys and girls. That the effect of the workshop balances out the indifferences between the two groups. And that both boys and girls made significant gains in those three areas. But the substantially greater gains amongst the girls are counteracting those priors, those prior low scores of girls uh, before they do our workshop rating, which I think is really pretty good. Um, this is only the beginning. Well, this is a seedling money from uh, NCWIT. We recently got some more money from the uh, uh, Time Warner Cable Connect a Million Minds program. And of course, we're always looking for more. Um, we want to do several uh, things going forward. The first, probably the major one that we want to do is actually point two on the slide, which is we need to know where the largest payoff is. At the moment, we've been hitting this wide range of, of potential grades of students, and we don't know where's the biggest bang for our buck. Is it in grade five? Is it grade six? Is it grade 11? And so we really want to see which of our students we're having the most important impact on. 
And in order to do that, and just generally because it's a good thing to do, we need to do a longitudinal study, which means we need to see what the impact of this is over time. How many times do we need to keep doing this in order to reinforce that people should be doing this? The best things I, I, I'm not really uh, having on the slides is the impact of the girls who uh, spent an enormous amount of time programming behaviors in their robot and an equal amount of time and making them little paper hats, uh, <laughs> which was great. And, and her friend saying, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't make a hat for a robot. And, and um, uh, her, the first girl saying, well, why not? It, it needs a hat. <laughs> this is, of course, perfectly reasonable also. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we want to do. I do want to just close out by saying um, you can go to our website, which is currently uh, slash robotics slash SRW. You can find all of the materials for our workshop there. We are free. So if you have a, a school group uh, or any kind of group who would benefit from uh, our kind of workshop, we are entirely free. Uh, get in touch with us. You can do that through our, our website. And we will come and we will give a social robotics education to any group you wish. Thank you very much.